Good evening and welcome to another in the series of our online town hall from Studio 21 with Arthur Saldiver. We are open to questions or comments and remember we are working for the development of Belmopan and Belize. We're, we'd like to thank all our viewers home and abroad for tuning in and our focus tonight for the first 45 minutes we would like to discuss the development in Belmopan and thereafter we will be looking at the broader country of Belize. We now turn it over to Mr. Saldir. Good night uh, Belmopan residents, friends, Greater Belize, the internet community, the Facebook community, if bookers. Tonight I come to you once more from Studio 21 to address the concerns primarily of the residents of Bomapan who are seeking effective representation and true leadership for the constituency to marshal its development in the interest and for the benefit of all residents of Bilmopan. In that vein, I'm here to field all questions, as always, on the issues, and to answer them as candidly as I can, to give you the information that you need to make an informed decision as it relates to your representation. The primary purpose and focus at this time is to qualify to contest the general election on behalf of the People's United Party in Bomapan. To be in a position to engage effectively the failed air representative John Saldiva and to ensure that we can put his record on the scrutiny to have all residents of Bomapan appreciate that John Saldiva is a man bereft of ideas, lacking in interest and commitment to the development of our great city, and certainly unworthy to continue to represent us, as he certainly does not share our principles or values. It is time for a change and I'm here to be your agent of change. Buenas noches, damas y caballeros. Estoy Arte Saldiva. Soy Arte Saldiva, disculpe. Eh, estoy aquí otra vez en nuestro programa para informar nuestra gente, nuestra residencia de Bemopan a la mensaje que hay para desarrollar nuestra constituencia para todos nuestros residentes para asegurar que todos hay la habilidad a mejorar la vida y para asegurar que nosotros podríamos a votar este vagabundo representante Jean Saudito él no hay interés no está compartiendo nuestros valores o principios y por eso Necesitamos asegurar que podíamos 
a cambiar este vagabundo cuando la elección general viene. Muchísimas gracias. Buenas noches, don Arturo. Sabemos que tenemos 45 minutos para hablar cosas de Bemopan. Vamos a decir que buenas noches a todos. Eh, ¿Usted puede con comenzar con el, la economía o, o qué tenemos para ofrecer a la gente en nuestros votantes de Bemopan? La economía de Bemopan, eh, la economía local, es muy importante porque la economía es la economía es la cosa que, que existe para asegurar que la gente podía ganar la plata necesaria para mejorar la vida. La cosa que pasa es que la población de nuestra constituencia está creciendo muy rápido y la población es muy grande y es más grande que la habilidad de la economía local podía a, a efectivamente, a, ¿cómo se dice? A, ¿Desarrollar? No, 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 no desarrollar. Es, es como, la cosa que pasa es que la economía no es, muy, no es más grande para, para tener la habilidad de asegurar que toda la gente podía tener trabajo y esa cosa para ahí la habilidad a ganar la plata que es necesario para comprar comida, para comprar medicina y todo eso. Nosotros estamos en una situación que por eso hay una gran parte de la población que está desempleo, o desempleado. Y eso es el problema porque hay más crimen ahora que existe antes. Y eso es un gran problema para la gente es que es muy joven y la gente que está bien. El desarrollo o la economía trae prosperidad. Eso es. Uh -huh. Y ahorita no, nosotros no está, no está prospero, nuestra uh -huh. gente. Hay mucha gente que está sufriendo. Sufriendo porque el precio para sobrevivir es muy alto. Es muy alto y no hay inversiones suficientes para para dar a la gente la habilidad a tener trabajos sustantivos y eso es parte de la razón que estoy aquí ofertando mi servicio a nuestra gente. What I'm explaining right now is that Belmopan has grown so much in its population and population has grown so rapidly that it has outstripped the capacity of the local economy to accommodate the numbers of people that require employment. As a result, the effects that has carried over from that has been a rise in crime. A rise in crime that has before now not been normal for Bomopan, especially in the areas of crimes of opportunity house breaking, burglaries, robberies, and the like. And we've also seen more murders in Bonpan than before. These are things that we must address. And many times we don't address the issue of crime until it reaches our doorstep. But we have to address it. And it has to be addressed as part of the ill effects of a bad and struggling economy. People are resorting to crime as a means to earning a living. That's when you know you're in a crisis because when one can justify wrongful acts, then it becomes entrenched. In Bumapan, we do not want this to be entrenched. We want to address it effectively, drain the swamp of unemployment, give our people meaningful jobs so that they can start to build a life for themselves and their families without having 
to resort to taking what others have put hard work and labor to accumulate and develop. Mm -hmm. You want to say something to our listeners that are Mayan speakers? Certainly, Again, if you can. You, you say and I translate word to word directly. Beautiful. What we have in Bamapan is a situation where the population has grown so rapidly that it has outstripped the capacity of the local economy to keep up. It has caused a rise in crime as one of its major ill effects. There are more robberies, more burglaries, and other crimes of opportunity as a result of our local economy being the way it is at this present time. We need greater investment in an atmosphere conducive to wealth creation, profit making. And one of the ways to make the atmosphere conducive is to reduce the level of taxation. We all know that one of the issues that is being presently ad addressed on an almost a daily basis is the price of fuel. And we must appreciate that the price of fuel has been artificially elevated, made to be high. By an unnecessary application of high burdensome taxes by the government of Belize. In order to combat this in Bumapan, what I would be seeking is the designation of the entire capital is the designation of the entire capital as a commercial free zone. Okay, we have a question from Miss Michelle Trapp. Good night, Arthur. This morning on Krem, the host said, The host said that the minister has a discretion to grant nationality to people who are from a country that does not recognize Belize's independence. However, One second. However, looking at the section 293, the provision speaks to a discretion to grant nationality to people who are titled under section 23 and section 25 and not in reference to section 293. Right. Could you please elaborate on this? This topic is vital and any misinformation can lead people astray. I am of the view that no minister has any discretion once the person falls under 29.3. And I concur with you wholeheartedly, Michelle. Good night, Michelle. Thank you very much for your question. Let me break it down so that those who are viewing us, viewing me, and our town hall can understand. When it relates, to discretion in legislation. Discretion has limits. It is not limitless. It's not that the minister has the discretion to, to do anything he wants. 
he can only exercise his discretion within the parameters of law, the four squares. As a result, when any public authority or public official exercises a discretion, it is tested against what is known as, in law as Wensbury reasonableness. Okay? Which means that that decision of the public authority or public official would be checked to see if it was done reasonably and in good faith. And if it was done in keeping with the spirit of the legislation where the Constitution puts in place an expressed prohibition, no subsidiary legislation, no legislation that comes and flows from the Constitution can grant a discretion that supersedes the constitutional prohibition. The Constitution is the supreme law. And the word supreme has but one meaning above all most powerful almighty and without rival supreme so when we have this type of misinformation going through the public forum it creates confusion and it allows for people to accept unlawful and unconstitutional acts to be the norm for example I heard this morning a person who I believe has the greatest responsibility to be informed as he seeks to hold the position of highest authority within Parliament I heard this person saying that persons from Guatemala who received citizenship are Belizeans although the Constitution expressly prohibits such to occur I want to have the public know that that is not so it cannot be so because the Constitution is the same it has been since 1981 on this issue. So when that person talks about people becoming Belizean citizens before 1981, nonsense. We were not an independent nation before 1981. And you could not be a nationalized or naturalized Belizean before 1981. Our naturalization process as Belizeans only relates back to when the Constitution was given force. Yes, there's a saving law clause. And that means that whatever laws existed at the time we were a colony would be maintained up and through the time that we became independent. But I digress. As it relates to the express prohibition in our constitution, that is clearly stating to all and sundry that if you come from a country that claims us and does not recognize our territorial, our territorial integrity or our sovereignty, that you cannot be naturalized. And by virtue of that, although you may have been given a certificate and a passport, those documents even if you were Belizeans are not yours they're the property of the government of Belize and since you got it erroneously you cannot enjoy the benefits of it as as real Belizeans do so at this particular juncture it is for those in authority to now do the right thing and those who want to become the administration to, to lead us to also appreciate what the right thing is. Guatemalans cannot renounce their citizenship. And Guatemala still maintains a claim against us. 
So it is incumbent upon us to begin the process to revoke those fraudulent documents that Guatemalans hold because we should not be accommodating a lie. We must seek to bring our citizenship back to the position of meaningfulness. Um, we have another question from Moses South. Can we take the government to court to get an injunction for them to stop them? Yes, we can. All that is required, Moses, is that you go to the re-registration process and observe as it is going on. You could probably go to Kaya West. That would be a best, the best testing ground. And observe the re-registration exercise that takes place. Listen to hear where the persons are giving, what address the persons are giving as their place of residence. And if you can track a couple of them going back across the border and you have their name, you can make the application that these persons coming from Melchor claiming to be living in Belize but are actually Belizean are actually Guatemalan citizens should not be made to occupy the voter rolls. This is one of the ways of doing that aspect of it, but you must recognize, however, that when they are going to register, that means they've already got the nationality certificate. You can also have the process be checked if you know of someone who has a nationality certificate who in actuality was a born Guatemalan, okay? That can be done as well. It takes a little bit of work, but it can be done. And don't let anybody tell you it's a fishing expedition. It's a particular class of people. And that particular class of people can always be effectively isolated and dealt with. Mm -hmm. We'd like to thank all our viewers for watching, home and abroad, and thanks to those um, watching in the comfort of your living room. We also want to thank you. And I want to say good night to Mr. Eone Rodonis. I want to say good night to Mr. Mike Osha. I want to say good night to all the residents of Bonpan, Mr. Hall, Mr. Nikki at the barber shop. Yes, um, the barber Nikki. Um, also, Chapo at the barber shop, uh, celebrity barber shop here in Libertad, and um, a number of other of our faithful viewers who tune in to us every Thursday at this time. Sancha Z, Ms. Sharit Zuniga, and uh, um, Brian Mira, we have uh, Sancha Z all the way from New York. Thank Beautiful. you. Beautiful. So, yes. Coming back to Bomapan because I, I, I cannot lose sight of why I am here. And I'm here because I'm contesting a convention in Bomapan on the 26th of August. Well, at least that is the legitimate expectation that I have, considering that my application has now been accepted by our great party. I want to make something clear before proceeding, there is some confusion as to what the legal process that was initiated by myself and the committee to elect Arthur Saldiva is all about. I want you to know, residents of Bumapan, that that legal process was not one that was taken against the party, because people are saying this. The party is the members. The members are the party. There can be no party, no People's United Party without members. Now, when you have a party and its members, by virtue of the constitution of the party, we elect officers. The officers are also members, so we're all equal, except that they are those among us who offer ourselves within the structure of the party to become either the leader 
the chairman, the campaign manager, and the various offices, officers within the party. So other members vote to have these members who offer themselves for those positions to so occupy. As a result, when those members are elevated to their positions, their elected position, they become trustees of the party by virtue of what the constitution requires. This means that they are not there in their elected position as leader, chairman, campaign manager, or whatever position they may hold to do as they like, but they are there to exercise their best judgment and to apply their talent and their energies for the benefit of the members of the party in the best interest of the party. Um, we have another question from Michael Usher. What's your opinion on the foreign minister's statement that Belizeans who don't support a yes to the ICJ are crazy? Well, Mr. Mike, um, I will say this again. If that is the foreign minister's position, then I am happy to be called crazy. I'll wear it as a badge of honor. But to be honest with you, it is an insult. It is degrading. It is the utterance of a man who is certainly not really and truly applying himself properly to what he is saying. I think that Mr. Elrington is a little bit touched himself. But um, here's the situation, Mr. Mike. As it relates to the ICJ, we in Belize can appreciate that there is no true education process when only one position is being advanced. That is more along the lines of what communist countries would do. Push only one option for people to consider. It's an indoctrination, a brainwashing. And that in itself is crazy. To believe that the Belizean people would accept such a high-handed approach to this very important existential question. No. Mr. Elrington has fallen off the apple cart and I'm afraid he has hit his head. El ministro de Asuntos Exteriores dijo que los belicenos que no van a apoyar que el país de Belice va al corte internacional para resolver el, el asunto con Guatemala somos, bueno, en su palabra dice, cita son locos ¿qué es su opinión? mi opinión es que este hombre es un payaso eh, no es alguien que nosotros podíamos uh, llevar su palabra en serio porque aparece que que él no no hay la habilidad de conocer la importancia de su posición uh -huh. nuestro país y el cuestión de, para consideración en la ICJ uh -huh. es un asunto de un gran significancia porque el ICJ va a tener la habilidad a decidir si nosotros vamos a tener todo nuestro territorio intacto o si nosotros va, vamos a perder la mitad o el entero de nuestro país y en esta consideración 
de nosotros en este referendo. Uh -huh. Necesitamos de tener toda la información de los dos lados. Uh -huh. Y nadie que está diciendo que no quiere ir, a, que no quiere a tener este riesgo, a hacer este riesgo, a perder nuestro país. Uh -huh. Es un posición inteligente, es una posición seguro, porque hay otras maneras para resolver el problema. La cosa que pasa es que nuestros líderes no, está, no están contándonos toda la información, están escondiendo una gran parte. Yo creo que ellos no está operando con bien fe y por eso no hay confianza en esta posición para ir a la ICJ. En pocas palabras, ellos deben dar a la población de Belice los dos partes, sí y los dos partes, no, sí. para llegar a una conclusión que sí o no, yeah. en vez de decirnos que son es. locos. No. La única persona que es, es loco es la persona que, que está diciendo que solamente un parte es importante. Okay. Muy bien. ¿Sí? Este hombre, vagabundo como Jan Saldívar. Todos somos vagabundos. Estos rojos. <laughs> All right, we... We are aware that there, there are numerous people. I know that there are people like Josephine McGee just joined us. Guadalupe Chicas. Good night. I mean, Guadalupe Chicas is the first time. I'm not sure if it's the first time, but I'm seeing her. We say good night to her. Good night, Miss Guadalupe. Um, Lee Usher from Los Angeles. We have Miss Doretta from Belmopan. Miss Belda, Mr. Briseño. Good night. And a host of others, no? But let me, let me get back to what I was um, stating in relation to the litigation. So these officers of the party, they were taken to court mm -hmm. in their representative capacity because it is my belief that the constitution was not being followed. The constitution in the party is the supreme law. The officers can come up with policies, they can come up with resolutions, but those policies and resolutions must conform with the constitution of the party. Where they do not conform, then it is open to challenge. And that, what has, that is what has been done. Now, I heard, <laughs> I heard the leader of our party say that the claim is frivolous. But, <laughs> and, let me give you the meaning of that word frivolous. I think it's a new word for certain people. Frivolous means of no importance or of little significance. But you must understand that although I will agree with him that I claim no victory in this legal challenge thus far, save and except to say that a couple weeks ago on the 1st of July, there was to be a convention. And then last week, Sunday, the 8th of July, there was to be a convention. And now the convention is set for August 26th. So I claim no victory, none whatsoever. And I will say that yes, my claim is so frivolous that the court did not impose an injunction, but that the great wisdom, generosity, and compassion that resides in the hearts of the leaders of my party have now allowed for me to apply so that I can be considered as one of the candidates in the upcoming convention on August 26th. I am not worthy, but I am grateful.
when it comes to the infrastructure, maybe you can begin to kind of share to the resident of Balapan, being the on becoming the ABA representative, or after the convention on August 26th. I, we know that we have a numerous streets in the city of Balapan that needs to be. We have 297 streets in Balapan, mm -hmm. and that is inclusive of streets in our outlying communities of La Rivera, mm -hmm. Las Flores, San Martin, Salvapan, Mayamopan. What we must do, however, and what I want all the viewers to understand, I am not running for mayor. We already have a mayor. There was a mayoral, look, uh, there was a mayoral election just recently. It is the province of the city council to address the issue of streets. That is their responsibility. The responsibility of the air representative, and I don't believe that John Saldiva understands this. I don't think he understands his job description because I always see these commercials for him highlighting streets. And the man has been in office for too long to not know what his job should be or what his job is. The job of the air representative is to ensure that Belmopan receives the resources necessary for its development, its overall development, to ensure that the private sector is given every opportunity to expand its presence in Bamapan so that more taxes can be generated, more money can be invested, and then the city council can do more of what it's supposed to do, which is to address streets and drains and picking up of garbage and allow for the general upkeep and maintenance of our city. But when you have an air representative who wants to double in the internal affairs of the city and micromanage the city council, it makes the city council redundant. He is not fulfilling the role that he should be fulfilling. And this is the reason why we are having so much problems in Bamapan. John Saldiva, sad to say, does not have the capacity or the aptitude to be our area representative. You see? The saying goes, he who knows not and knows not, he knows not, is a fool. That is John Saldiva. All this talk about streets and addressing internal infrastructure, that's not his role. Let me tell you, one of the first projects that I would embark upon as your ear representative is to ensure that we get the private sector to build the road connecting Orange Walk with Roaring Creek. It is a project that would have to be done in tandem with the representative of Kaya South and the entire parliament in order for us to invoke what every sovereign government has at its disposal, eminent domain, that legal instrument of eminent domain to have right of way through private lands for public benefit. Once we secure the right of way to span the 37 mile distance between Roaring Creek and Orange Walk, then you invite the private sector to bid on the construction. We are not going to be borrowing to build this road. We are going to be entering into a profit sharing agreement with the private sector. You have heard from time immemorial Mr. Price saying that what we subscribe to in Belize is a mixed economy. A mixed economy means that at all times, as it relates to major projects, 
the public sector plays its role and the private sector plays its role. The role of the public sector is to set the direction and create the conducive atmosphere. The role of the private sector is to bring the finances and the management to the project to have it be realized. We need to get back to what George Price first envisioned, the mixed economy. Uh, we'd like to thank some of our viewers for watching. Michelle Shabat, Luceli, Mr. Contreras, Samantha, Elroy. And now we have a question from Rose Martin. Marin, sorry. When you win the convention and if the present government splits Belmopan, which area will you choose and why? I am a Belmopan original. I'm from 2325 Garza Avenue. I am a son of the capital. This is my home. I intend to stay at home in Belmapan. There is only space for one Saldiva in Parliament. And I'm going to ensure with your support that I am the Saldiva that's going to be there. Not that vagabond by the name of John Saldiva. His time has come and gone. We have another question from Mr. Michael Usher. As I understand it, a person who gives wrong information to a registration officer for the purpose of being registered as a voter has committed an offense at the time of his or her misrepresentation. Cannot action having the evidence be taken in the Supreme Court prior prior to the disclosure of the list of registered voters? No. No, Mr. Mike, the registration process is such that one, you go to the registration office during this re-registration exercise in Bomapan, that is United Evergreen Primary School and Garden City Primary School. You go there, you give the information. The information is taken by the registration officer. Then the election and boundaries has the responsibility to then investigate that information. They go and they find that the person is not there and they get confirmation that he doesn't live there. Then that person does not get to be on the list. If they go and there is confirmation that the person lives there, he, also, he then gets on the list. Once he is on the list, that is not the end of it. Because the law allows, or the law requires, that the list is published. Once the list is published, then those in the community that has the information and recognizes that the person who is claiming to be a resident and qualified elector in the constituency in truth is not, they have the right then to object. When the objection is made, the party who is objected to is required to come to court to provide the basis upon which he or she is claiming the right to be an elector. That is where the challenges are done. It is set procedure. It, will, it cannot be truncated. It cannot be short-circuited because it will be premature. The law sets the procedure and it goes step by step to the point of objection. Once the objection is successful, the person is taken off. If the objection is not successful, the person stays on. This is the reason why I have been asking our residents to be vigilant. We first need the information. Who is coming in to be registered? If you know them to be from Roaring Creek, Camelote, Tiketel, Ontario, Unitedville, or any of the other villages, then we get that information. And I've had 
members of the campaign team on the ground taking this information and we wait we wait to see if election and boundaries catches it if they don't then we have been compiling the necessary data to be able to effectively challenge it in the courts um, we have another question from miss berlin pitts what is your position on the disenfranchisement of those in the diaspora my position berlin is very simple belizeans are belizeans wherever they may be there are two issues as it relates to our economy the gnp and the gdp the gross domestic product speaks about revenue generation and production within our nation borders within our boundaries physical boundaries gross national product speaks to the development and earnings of belizeans anywhere in belize and outside of belize the diaspora has always been a part of Belize's economic development. We have been able to track that every year, and that contribution to our economy is in the measure of $80 million a year. That's a sizable chunk. That $80 million that the diaspora contributes goes directly into the hands of poor families who then uses that money to pay taxes, to buy goods, to engender services, and keep the general economy of Belize afloat. This is the reason why it is criminal for any elected official to come and say that your citizenship is to be circumscribed that somehow by virtue of you going outside of Belize to realize the full potential of your intellectual gifts, that you should be punished. That is unconstitutional. That is illegal. Also, when you compare that with the position accepting the unconstitutional naturalization of Guatemalans and the allowance of Guatemalans to vote. <laughs> Man, anybody who carries these contrary views has to be checked and checked hard. Uh, Mr. Michael Usher, again, um, what, if the, what if the misrepresentation is he, she has lived in the constituencies for two months. Yes, Mr. Mike, as I explained, the process requires that the electoral agents, the registration agents, take the information. Whether information be right or wrong, their responsibility is to take it. The information is tested by the investigators who go out to visit the physical location that the elector claims to be residing in. If the elector really resides there and is found there, then from what I've been able to ascertain, the process of investigation is done. What has been happening, the, 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 the wrong practice that has been adopted by election and boundaries has been to take quote unquote landlords information the landlord says yeah he lived there renter and that has been sufficient to allow for persons to be entered on the list or some other person other than the actual applicant that is wrong the law says that the head of the household so if the person is a renter the landlord has no basis it's only the renter because when you rent a property, when you're paying monies for the right to occupy, you become the head of that household. And only you as the head of the household can confirm 
whether or not you are the person living there. So the investigators would have to go back until they find you or they have to question the neighbors if they know you. And if the neighbors say, I don't know the man or I don't know the lady, then that is prima facie evidence that you are telling a lie. Okay. Uh, Ms. Carla Pena Fields, um, you spoke of evoking the right for eminent domain, which means you are evoking the right to take people's homes and land that is in the way of your development. What would these people get for compensation for their land or property? Okay. Yes, I'm not talking about taking anybody's home or land. What I'm talking about in terms of invoking eminent domain, it is to get a right of way. So yes, you'll be crossing private land and you have to pay market value for the land. What that would entail, however, since you're talking about the development of a road, which is within the public domain and for the public benefit, is that you would either be compensating that person with monies out of the public purse, but that is not what I subscribe to. I subscribe to either tax credit or tax relief or an inclusion in the profit of the project. This project between Bamapan, between Roaring Creek and Orange Walk that I am saying the private sector should invest in is one that would be told. I'm talking about the creation of a road of convenience. And the reason why I'm saying it is necessary and the reason why I'm saying it would be beneficial to Bamapan is because presently, for us, the residents of Bamapan, and even persons coming from Cayo, San Ignacio, sorry, Santa Elena, to get to Orange Walk or Corozal, we have to drive all the way up to Hattieville, cut off, go down the Boom Road, and then go up to Orange Walk. It is almost 82 miles from Bamapan, because from Bamapan to Hattieville is 35 miles. From Hattieville Junction with the Ladyville Road, with the Boraboom Ladyville Road, is 12 miles. So that's 47 miles. Then we go another 35 miles to Orange Walk. We would be cutting that distance by more than half if we were to make this road, if we were to realize this road between Roaring Creek and Orange Walk. And we're not talking about these little two-lane roads that we have here in Belize. When you build road of convenience, you build it to be fast, safe, and efficient. So you're talking about putting a four-lane highway to connect Orange Walk with Roaring Creek and Bumapan. Because I envision a time when Roaring Creek will become a part of Bumapan. It is the natural order of things. Bamapan as a city must expand and we must expand in a way to allow for greater commercial activity to take place and for more wealth to be created so that we can accommodate a greater population. So I do envision Bamapan expanding beyond the Belize River and beyond the Cebu River in the process of our development. And in order to do these things, we have to generate new streams and steady streams of revenue. It is, it is unacceptable for our country to have our economic activity cease at 5 p.m. on most days and at 9 p.m. on weekends. We cannot create enough wealth by having an economy that stops. Our economy should be running on a 24-hour cycle. When you put in roads of convenience, the road is itself a revenue-generating entity that never sleeps. It's a 24-hour functioning financial institution. And we need to create more and more of it. The only toll we have in Belize right now is that toll at the, Liber at the um, Tower Hill Bridge. That's the only toll. And it's a toll that was only should have that only should have lasted a limited period of time we have paid we have paid for that bridge a hundred times over and that bridge needs to repl be replaced it needs to be replaced and right now i doubt we have the money to replace it even though we've been collecting tools somebody need to check that <coughs> we should have stopped paying tools at the tower hill bridge a long time ago 
but we still have to pay 75 cents every time we go north. Ridiculous. I know that you mentioned about crime when you began the program in Spanish and uh, as yes. well in English. I know that our residents in the city of Melbourne are concerned about crime. Can you elaborate or can you share your ideas? Yes. Well, as I've explained, one of the root causes of crime is unemployment and poverty. Mm -hmm. Right? And we are our misery index in Bonapan is growing because the population has been growing unchecked. Uh, by large measure, we have been growing in relation to the immigration situation. There's been no real comprehensive immigration policy, and we are getting, in relation to persons from Central America, a lot of gang members coming from Honduras right. and Salvador. We have entrenched communities of Mara Salvatrucha, mm -hmm. 13 and 18 street gangs. I have witnessed it in my walk through areas of Bumapan, in Las Flores, in Mayamupan, in San Martin and Salvapan particularly. And I have known of incidences of exploitation that has been taking place, especially among persons working at the bars and in some of our established uh, restaurants and recreational areas here in Bumapan mm -hmm. proper. In order for us to address Mara Salvatrucha, we have to drain the swamp of their potential recruits. The only way we are going to do that is if we are able to ensure that our teenage youth remain in school to get their education and to ensure that once they become educated, they have jobs to go to. to, to, go to. Bumapan is the capital. In order for us to get a quick injection of meaningful capital, we need to employ the legislation that exists to create the commercial free zone status that will allow for persons who want to invest in commercial activities in, in Bumapan to capitalize on the opportunity to access goods at duty-free rates. And to have those goods available to not only Bumapan residents but tourists and others of the diplomatic community at duty-free prices. I mean, how ridiculous is it that we have the U.S. Embassy, the British High Commission, the Brazilian Embassy, the Salvadoran Embassy, the Nicaraguan Embassy, and all of these other embassies in Bumapan, and all of their personnel and diplomats have to go outside of Bumapan elsewhere to shop. This is the capital. This is where the money must be invested. This is where the money must stay so that our residents are given a chance. We have lost control of the public sector because every minister brings in their own staff from their districts. Everybody is concentrated in, our, in, in Bumapan when it comes to public sector jobs. So where are our Bumapan residents going to find jobs? Bumapan was not built for our people to move outside of its boundaries to find jobs. It was built to ensure that we had the capacity and the ability to come home at 12 o'clock and be with our families and come home at a reasonable hour at the end of the day so that our, so that our children were given guidance. Children like me when I was young, and you know me, I was a hard case. I was not the best behaved child and I needed that supervision. And you see what it has done for me. I am here now seeking to represent you. There are so many that need that direction that are not getting it. And if we don't put in, the, put in these measures, we are going to be producing more and more delinquents in Bumapan, and I will not stand for that. We have a comment from us, Steve. Hey, I told them that, that the toll bridge, um, and the reply was that the city council is continuing to collect toll to help the poor people in Orange Rock and the upkeeping of the town. <laughs> that is not the responsibility. See, you know, again, Mr. Ozieta, what I will tell you is that's another form of corruption, man. You cannot 
be collecting a toll under the pretext of recovering funds to pay back a loan and then once the loan is paid change the purpose on the people that's wrong mm. <laughs> the toll ends when the loan yeah. is repaid you need to employ better planning and fiscal policy to raise money and you don't throw money after the poor you give the poor opportunities for employment so that they no longer remain poor but whenever you give the man a fish without teaching him how to fish then you are robbing him of his dignity and his drive to be all that he could be george price always said wake up and work the poor must be given jobs they must be given work so that they can earn and save and change their lives poverty is not a permanent condition if you can work and earn a living it all depends on you we cannot be providing welfare because we as a nation are on welfare ourselves so we are setting up ourselves to fail that is a cop out that toll should be ended build roads of convenience shorten the distance for our citizens so that they can get from point A to point B where they really want to go quicker and more monies will be in their pockets and more money will be in the coffers of the government it would be at 80 20 split 80% of the private sector investors 20% goes to government a new revenue revenue stream would be opened just on that one single project and Belmopan and Orange Walk would benefit immensely I hope the leader of the opposition hears me because this is something that he can put in his cup to offer to the Belizean people and it would impact on his constituency as well as ours here in the West. Uh, Ms. Carla Pena has a question. With this said, what is your plan and incentive for local business to be Belizean owned? It is sad to see that most of our businesses are no longer owned or run by Belizeans. This, Ms. Pena, is one of the areas that I believe that the diaspora can play a pivotal role. We have the country of Belize has been taken hostage by predatory banks Belize Bank Scotia Bank Atlantic Bank Heritage Bank none of these banks and don't even talk about National Bank none of these banks are working in the interest of Belize or Belizeans as a result it is so very hard, almost impossible for the Belizean entrepreneur to access capital because he or she is looked at as a person without means. But any who from North America or Europe can walk in without any collateral and just some bullshit line and get credit facilities extended, loans offered, and are able to dance out of the bank happy, default on their loans, and go back to their countries at the end of the day, and it has been done quite a lot. But Belizeans are not given, not even the opportunity with the best business plans. The diaspora needs to come together. The diaspora need to establish their own financial institution in Belize. This is one of the ways that we can have a physical presence from our diaspora in Belize doing something that these predatory banks is not doing. When you consider that the diaspora contributes $80 million a year, 10 years diaspora contribution is $800 million. Okay? 12 years diaspora contribution is close to a $1 billion. The diaspora has the capacity and the financial wherewithal to establish its own financial institution in Belize for the benefit of Belizeans. We have another question from Ozti. What should we do if a lease land has been cancelled with foundation on it and tax being paid? A lease land, under our law and under the conditions of lease, cannot be cancelled once development is ongoing. 
it is something that has to be challenged. You first take the issue up with the Registrar of Lands. Show them your receipts for the taxes that you've paid and have them come and inspect the land in order to reverse the cancellation. Many times what is done is that the cancellation takes place without these procedures being done. This brings me to the point where I left you last Thursday as it relates to title insurance. And I want to bring you up to speed on title insurance because it is important. It's one of the things that I believe would be able to curb fraud in our system. As you know, the Prime Minister of Belize has labeled the Lands Department a hotbed of corruption. And for the most part, it has been. Here's how title insurance works. Most insurance, the ones that you traditionally hear of, deals with an assumption that something will happen. When you buy homeowner's insurance, you are insuring your home against the possibility that a fire may occur that destroys your investment or that somebody may enter and burglarize your home or that some natural disaster may come like a hurricane or a, well, we don't have tornadoes or maybe an earthquake or something like that and your investment is compromised. In that event, the insurance company steps in and indemnify you gives you back monies to restore your property to the way it would have been had these incidences not occurred. Title insurance, on the other hand, deals with a risk that may have already happened. So it's different. You're not dealing with something that, is, that, is, that may happen. You're dealing with something that might have happened already, except that you didn't know. So when you buy title insurance, it is to ensure that the title insurance company addresses issues of fraud so that if there is a problem with the title and somebody else has a valid claim to that title, that you would be in a position to have your investment returned to you without loss. What it does, it puts a powerful entity in the position of referee as an independent arbiter to address any issue that may impact upon your title so that when you have engaged in the transaction as a buyer that you are protected our real estate industry is under significant strain as a result of the acts of corruption in the Ministry of Lands. We're at the very ministry that is supposed to be protecting our citizens and ensuring that we are given the opportunity to own land are actually deliberately doing things like reselling private property, transferring leases without notifying leaseholders, canceling leases without proper procedure being followed, all of these things would be addressed by the title insurer. So by the time the, by the, time the, con the, the transaction is concluded, you would be in a position to know that the title you receive cannot be challenged. It safeguards the process and it weeds out the corrupt because it exposes them. This is one of the ways that we can get back the lands department and have those who work there operate within the parameters of law. Another question from Ms. Carla Pena. Yes, all good information, but what is your direct plan? Direct plan as to what? Businesses. Belizean owned businesses. Belizean owned businesses. Well, Ms. Pena, as I said, in order to have Belizean-owned businesses, Belizeans must first have access to capital. What I am for is for private sector occupation and private sector, private sector driving of our economy. 
the Belizean private sector is certainly for Belizeans, but Belizeans must have access to capital. What would be required in terms of having Belizean own businesses is first we must educate Belizeans to want to be entrepreneurs. That is not something that I can legislate. That has to be an interest that Belizeans have and an aspiration that we have. I can only be in a position to support those ambitions and aspirations. And I will tell you that wherever Belizeans come with a plan for investment that can create employment, I will support it. That is why I'm here. That's why I'm offering myself. The private sector has the duty and the responsibility to drive the economy, and I am here to ensure that they do. The days for which the public sector, those in government, pick winners and losers by virtue of regulation, taxation, and cronyism, has to be done away with. The free and open marketplace of ideas and investment is where the future is at. And we need to embrace it lest we get left behind. We have to put our house in order. And the way we put our house in order is by having the objectivity of profit guide our economic development. Profit without the interference of politics and politicians. Belize is strategic in its location. Its potential is unrivaled by any in, in the region. But we need the right leadership to allow for that potential to be realized. And that leadership has to be one that respects the role of the private sector and seeks to empower it. If we do not empower the private sector, we will remain poor. In empowering the private sector, Carla, that is where Belizeans will appreciate their place in the investment arena. But if there is a deliberate and orchestrated program to oppress investment, then those who may be willing will be scared to take the risk because every and any investment is a risk. Uh, Mr. Michael Usher has another question. Was not the Registered Land Act supposed to solve the land problem? Why is it that surveys to affect, to affect declaration under this act has been put on hold? The Registered Land Act is a, is a legislation that allows for land certificates to be produced in a way that can be easily tracked and identified. But legislation hardly ever eliminates corruption because legislation without enforcement is meaningless. You need to have an interested party that is actively pursuing the enforcement of the legislation behind it because left on its own without the benefit of that interested party those in authority knowing that the general public don't read legislation as a matter of course will always seek to abuse this is i mean this is basically what has been the problem with everything including the whole guatemalan nationalization issue. We are not taught our constitution. Most Belizeans don't know. Even those working at the Ministry of Immigration, they don't know the constitution. So they operate within an atmosphere of ignorance. And within that atmosphere of ignorance, they willfully break the law. And this has been our problem. The ignorance I speak of is the fact that the legislation that governs immigration, which is the 
the, 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 the Passport and Nationality Act, Immigration Nationality Act, it does not address that provision within the Constitution that deals with the prohibition of Guatemalans. So as a result of that, those at the Immigration Department and within the Ministry of Immigration, they don't look to the Constitution for direction. They only look at the subsidiary legislation. As a result, they believe that they're empowered to do what they're doing because the, that act that governed the ministry does not address the issue. If we were taught in the schools what our Constitution contains, then it would not be a situation where a first-class clerk or immigration officer don't know. So these willful errors would not take place because they would know better. But the Constitution is not a part of the curriculum at any level. There is no level in the Belizean education system where the Constitution is required material for academic study. That is wrong. That is short-sighted. That in and of itself is a clear indication that those who are administrating our country have no real interest in having our people informed. An informed population is captive to the corrupt. We must take the sheet from over the eyes of our people and expose them to the light of day so that at the end of the day, we can be making informed decisions and we'll have a better society as a result. This is what I'm for. And we'll be taking our last question for tonight from us, Steve. How is it possible that a person can be working for over 20 years and whenever they visit the income tax department in Belize City for a letter to show a history of your payments, you are now being told to me that they have absolutely no records to show payment, etc. Steve, I wish I could answer you that question, my friend. Um, but I must confess that that one is beyond me. I don't understand why not. It should be easy. It should be academic. You are required by law once you're employed to fill out your your w2 forms or whatever they call the form and um, make your income tax payments your employer also has a responsibility to disclose uh, what you're being paid and to withhold certain uh, monies for that purpose so it shouldn't be a situation where the department would not be in a position to reproduce a record. So I, 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 am, uh, I am not um, in a position to say why they have not been, unless the record keeping has been compromised in some way. And uh, certainly I do believe that um, that should be addressed so you should go back and see Maybe somebody didn't understand fully what you were requesting, but um, if I hear you right, that shouldn't be a difficulty at all. Uh, Mr. Saldiba, we'd like to thank you for addressing all these issues tonight and sure um, our viewers home and abroad appreciate um, all the information that you have given to them. We'd like to thank all our viewers for tuning in tonight and we look forward to having you again next Thursday. Same time from Studio 21. Do have a wonderful night. Thank you. Feliz noche. Feliz noche. <laughs>